Welcome to Historically Speaking. This is episode 200. I'm your host, Michael Dwyer, and today we are going to be paying tribute to the founder of Historically Speaking, Jim Davidson, who certainly had a larger than life presence for all who knew him. We're going to focus on some facts of his life, but we cannot, in the space of this episode, uh, speak about everything in a life that uh, was over 91 years. So a, a couple of facts about Jim. He was born on the 11th of November, 1931, in Claremont, New Hampshire. Now from his obituary, it said his father's name was Milfred, but that didn't sound quite right to me. So I checked out his dad's birth certificate and it is Milford. And I suspect it has something to do with the town of Milford, New Hampshire. Jim was the only child of his parents. His mother's name was Ruth Sanborn. And Jim was very active in the Sanborn Family Association. Jim passed away on a Sunday morning on the 7th of May in this past year. And he is the husband uh, of Helen Francis Keene, the father of seven children, 13 grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren. I knew Jim for over 40 years, the time of uh, the length of my membership in the Rutland Historical Society. Uh, Jim has always been part of the story of Rutland history. I also knew Jim and Helen as grandparents, having taught two of their grandchildren. And I would like to thank their daughter, Monica Davidson Keith, for loaning us some family photographs. And here we have Jim in a studio picture. He's probably no more than three years old. And then a slightly later picture, circa 1938, 1939, of Jim in front of his parents' home with the family dog. And I know Jim would appreciate being uh, shown as Jim in history, because here we have two United States Census entries for the Davidson family, first in 1940, when we can see Jim's dad with his name spelled correctly, Milford, uh, mother Ruth, Jim at the age of eight. And then 10 years later, we have the same Davidson family household still living in Charleston, New Hampshire. Love this picture of Jim, his college graduation picture from St. Anselm's College, class of 1953. Jim was a summa cum laude graduate, no surprise, majoring in history. Jim married Helen on the 8th of September, 1956. The uh, mass was performed by a cousin of Helen's who was a Franciscan priest. And I think this uh, just captures Jim and Helen. And um, thinking about their, their marriage date, September 8th, 1956, I was very honored to be invited to their 50th anniversary celebration with the Mass Renewal of Vows at St. Peter's Church and a reception thereafter. After Jim and Helen moved to Rutland, uh, Jim spent many years as a history teacher at MSJ. We have uh, at the center here Jim's yearbook picture from about 1962. And here is a, a funny thing about the group picture uh, with some of the Sisters of St. Joseph, Sister Anna Marie, Pauline, and Sister Mary Vincent, who was Sister Clementine's sister, and Sam Rosieri. This is the same classroom where I taught at MSJ. The map was still there in the 80s when I was teaching. And I also even acquired the desk that Jim used. 
And one day when I opened the drawer, there were cassette tapes in there. And on some of the cassette tapes uh, were some of Jim's lectures. And also from those yearbooks, we have the days when Jim was a basketball coach. And, and I think in all fairness and completion, completeness of the story, the, these were difficult years uh, for Jim, uh, supporting a large family on a teaching salary, working two jobs. Uh, I, as time went on and Jim went from MSJ to the College of St. Joseph and then onward to Castleton, knowing Jim largely during his retirement years, during his so-called retirement years, he was busier than ever, but upon reaching retirement age, he could do what he wanted, and there were, uh, there were a lot of enjoyable things about all of that. So he was a founding member in 1969 of the Rutland Historical Society, a little clip about the founding of the society. And this is a typical picture from some point in the 90s um, when I became involved with the Historical Society. And we have Alan Shelby, Carmine Packer, and Jim upstairs always archiving and cataloging something. And with these uh, period pictures from the Rutland Historical Society, I am thankful to the staff for finding them for us. Here is a picture of the cleanup crew um, up front. Um, we have Elaine Purdy up front um, and others. I see Mary Segali here, uh, Patty Tucker, um, Carmine Packer, and then uh, Helen uh, <laughs> with the large lamb duster on the right. Another picture from the um, early 90s with Jim, then Mayor, uh, Jeff Wenberg, and Elaine Purdy, whom I believe at the time was the president of the Rutland Historical Society. A very typical picture of Jim uh, in his presentation mode in one of the many uh, exhibitions. And I think that from what I see, behind him, this might have been the Hotel Berwick Fire, which I think was in 1973. Another presentation on Jim with early Rutland history, and Jim wrote his graduate thesis, which took him many years to complete on the early history of Rutland. And I know of no one living that had as much Rutland history in his head um, and ready to deliver as Jim did. A typical work session at the Rutland Historical Society. One of the people at left who was a vital force in the society for many years was Dorothy Whitford. Uh, Jim at right with Carmine Packer. One of the aspects that Jim reveled in are the various parades that the Historical Society uh, uh, participated in. So you can see the one and the banner for the 20th year of the Historical Society in 1989 and always is part of Halloween parades and other such things. Jim and Helen uh, cheerfully donned costumes. So here they are, is the bride and groom. <laughs> and I love this picture. I, I don't know if they're the American version of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, but once again, you can see clearly how happy that Jim and Helen are uh, to don historical costumes. Jim with his banjo walking in the parade, and again, a great ambassador for all the years that he was involved in the Rutland Historical Society. And Nick Wackett, Nick, will actually have a video clip of uh, Nick Wackett, Nick. And uh, as I've said to some folks here, I don't know many people 
who at a certain point in their lives would have enjoyed donning a squirrel costume <laughs> to the degree that, that Jim did. And the other thing, too, uh, with Jim beginning in the 90s is his love of big band music and the Friday night dances. And here we can see um, two snapshots of him <coughs> and Helen dancing. And once again, uh, on one of their little trips, posing in front of Schmitz in um, one of these cardboard cutout posters. Um, they always did things together. And now <clears throat> to bring us into historically speaking and the significance of our show, you can see a clip from the Rutland Historical Society newsletter in June of 1999 that inaugurates the beginning of the, the show. And they were very ambitious at that point because they thought they could do it every other week. That kind of um, <laughs> dissipated. It was just untenable that that could be a new show every other week. And I noticed that as of today, when I counted all of the various episodes, Jim was directly involved with 122 of them. And thanks to the ongoing work of the Historical Society and its website, we have a list of all the episodes of Historically Speaking. And you can see the clip that I have here from the website that has each episode described as well as a link to the video. And with today's episode, this will be my 59th appearance on Historically Speaking. We are going to see now a series of clips to give you a sense of the depth and breadth of Jim's contribution to Historically Speaking. The first one is Jim's explanation of the photos of David Sawyer from around 1898. Hello, I'm Jim Davidson of the Rutland Historical Society, and I'll be your host today for Historically Speaking. Our guest today is a little out of the ordinary, yet important to the history of Rutland. It is the photo album of David H. Sawyer. And it is thanks to David that we have a wonderful photographic record of Rutland as it was a hundred years ago. David H. Sawyer was the younger son of Henry A. Sawyer. His mother was Julia Putnam Sawyer. David's father was the proprietor of H.A. Sawyer and Company, a wholesale and retail stationary business on Merchant's Row opposite the railroad depot. David was born at 44 Washington Street on the 6th of September 1878. He died in the same house on the 18th of December 1909 at age 31 after a two-week illness with pneumonia. David had suffered a severe attack of scarlet fever at age nine, from which he never entirely recovered. Notice the cane in this picture. He attended the public and private schools of Rutland, but was not graduated on account of his ill health. He was never able to enter actively into any business due to his illness. But sometime around 1898, he acquired a camera, and during his brief lifetime, left us a wonderful glimpse of late 19th century Rutland. Although David's photos mostly include friends and family, many show local buildings and streets in the background. David was survived by his older brother, James P. Sawyer of Rutland, who would die at age 41 only five years later. 
and a sister, Marielle Sawyer, Mrs. H.W. Hudson, of Hoosick Falls, New York, and an aunt, Mrs. Mary P. Clark of Rutland, who was the informant on his death certificate. David had been predeceased by both his father and mother. Here, the right background shows the towers of the Baptist Church and the county courthouse. This is the Congregational Church from Center Street. Note the small tower on the chapel, which is no longer there. The post office and federal courthouse, which is now the library, show in this picture. Note the postal wagon at the door. From left to right, the Baptist Church, the Rutland County Courthouse, and the Federal Courthouse and Post Office on Center Street. The south part of Whale Street, between Washington Street and Strong's Avenue. Another view of the same street from David's home at 44 Washington Street. This is the intersection of Wales and Washington Streets. The Bardwell Hotel is in the left distance. A view of the Bardwell Hotel from the porch at 44 Washington Street. The Bardwell and the buildings on the southwest corner of Wales and Washington Streets are in the background of this picture. This is an excellent view of the streetscape in the distance on the west side of Merchant's Row. Here are two young men, one black and one white. They pose in front of the Bardwell Hotel across from City Hall. This is a Swift Meat Company building on the west side of Merchant's Row, near where Price Chopper is today. This panorama of Merchant's Row is looking north. It includes the Depot Park and the Clement Bank Building with the clock. One of the episodes that Jim and I did together was episode 39 on the subject of Irish immigration. Welcome to a Historically Speaking. I'm Jim Davidson and I'm going to be your host for today's program. Today we have uh, Michael Dwyer with us. Michael's a teacher, genealogist, and uh, we're welcoming Michael back again. He has previously done a program on French-Canadian immigration. He's done another program on Polish immigration, and a third program on Italian immigration. And today his program is going to be on the Irish immigration to Rutland. Some of us may wonder, well don't the Irish all understand and speak English? Uh, are they really that kind of an immigrant that we need a program to help sort it all out? Well, there is a Gaelic language and there is a Gaelic dialect. And uh, Michael has agreed with me that this has led to many cases of garbling of Irish names. And I'm going to kind of let Michael uh, take it from there. Welcome to the program, Michael. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here again with you on Historically Speaking. And this subject is one that is near and dear to my heart. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to begin our journey back today by considering what a difference a decade makes. And I would like us to briefly consider what Rutland, Vermont was at the time of the 1840 census. It was the town of Rutland, much larger than we know it today with uh, West Rutland uh, and Proctor and Rutland Town, all part of it. Rutland in 1840 had a population of only 2,708 people. It was actually down 46 from what it was the decade before. So certainly not a very large community. And as you look through the names, particularly the first names in an 1840 census, you find some typical names from that period, and I would like to read you several of these. Hiram, Asa, Moses, Marcellus, Ephraim, Phineas, Lucius, 
Erastus, for women, many Sarahs, and several thankfuls. You get the feeling just from that list of names that this was a fairly homogenous population at that time. Many of these people were uh, the sons and daughters, the grandchildren of some of the other New England settlers who came to uh, Rutland in the, in the years following the American Revolution. Typically Yankees. Yes. Ten years later, by 1850, there is a major transformation to the face of the Rutland region. The population by 1850 would be up a uh, thousand, it would be 3,715, and most of that influx, perhaps 70 to 80 percent of the influx of people coming into the Rutland area at that time were Irish famine immigrants. And before we begin to look at some of the specific families and patterns of settlement in the Rutland area, I think it's worth our digressing for several minutes to consider the nature and the impact of the Irish famine. Ireland had a population of, oh, we'll say four or five million in 1800. By 1841, the population of Ireland was over eight million. And I should add, Ireland in the 20th century um, has barely topped five million. So the population of Ireland today still doesn't equal what it was in 1841. Episode 140 featured Jim interviewing Bill Masriello on Rutland Barbers. And this was also the subject of a Rutland Historical Society quarterly. Welcome to Historically Speaking. I'm Jim Davidson of the Rutland Historical Society, and I'll be your host for today's episode. Our guest today is Bill Mazzarello, who is the author of a book on the registry of the Rutland Barbershops. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking about the Rutland Barbers Union. There's a bit of a story behind this. Uh, both Bill and I had not been really aware of much about this Barbers Union, certainly not its early history. But the Vermont Historical Society came up with a account book, but it wasn't clear what the account book was for. There were initials used and there were some dates given, but that created a bit of a problem. They knew it seemed to be from Rutland because uh, there were some Rutland entries, a lot of Rutland entries, and uh, they contacted the Rutland Historical Society. We did a little digging, sampled a few of the names, and they appeared to, some of them at least, were Rutland barbers. Some seemed to have other occupations as well. And finally, we found in a directory the listing of the journeyman uh, chapter or unit 231 of the Rutland Barbers Union, and that put it all together. Uh, the Vermont Historical Society made a typescript of that, sent us a digital copy. I've shared that with Bill, and it filled in a lot of pieces for Bill mm -hmm. about what was going on. Um, I'd like to just uh, bring your, your attention uh, that Bill has been involved in the writing of a quarterly called the Registry of Rutland Barbershops. And then, <laughs> keeping in mind uh, the humor here, episode 143 is the interview with Nick Wackett. Nick. Welcome to Historically Speaking. I'm Jim Davidson of the Rutland Historical Society, and I'll be your host for today's episode. We have a special program today. It's about Nick Wackett Nick. Nick Wackett Nick is the mascot of the Rutland Historical Society, and uh, he's going to be our guest today. Uh, 
where's Nick? I don't see Nick. Uh, he's somewhere in the studio. Oh, there he is. Ah, you finally made it, Nick. Good for you. Hello, Mr. Davidson. Well, welcome to Historically Speaking, Nick. Uh, you may wonder that uh, squirrels don't speak English, but Peg TV has graciously provided a way for us to hear Nick's responses in English, and uh, we hope that you can enjoy that. The first question that we have to ask ourselves is, why a squirrel mascot? Well, there he was, right there in front of the building. Um, first, squirrels are known for their skills in gathering and preserving. These are all skills that are admired by the Rutland Historical Society. And secondly, the word Nick Walkett means place of the squirrel. Nick, when you were selected to be the mascot, how did you feel about that? What did you think? Well, Mr. Davidson, I felt really honored because uh, I've been a, a big historian for many years. My family goes back many generations in this area, and it seemed like a natural fit to me. Well, that is great. Now, here is Nick in his first parade in the year 2006. It was the Loyalty Day Parade. And during that parade, the society was giving out golden nuts with a coupon inside redeemable for a free society publication. And sign says, these nuts are not for eating. They are redeemable just for reading. Open and see. And as we come to the conclusion of the show, I've invited Tom Leipold to say a few words because he was at Jim's side from the beginning of Historically Speaking, which Tom told me was recorded in the basement of the Adelphia Cable Studio to the years that we were at the vocational school to its present, uh, to where we are now at PEG TV headquarters. So Mr. Tommy Leipold, here we are, episode 200. You were there from the beginning. Did you ever think we'd be 199 episodes I into would the never, future? No, I would have never yeah. imagined that we'd make yeah. it to So what are your thoughts episodes? about Jim and his contribution to this show, his vision for a show that now, 23 years on, we're still doing it? I think it's amazing, actually, now that I've I've been here for a couple decades myself and then some, almost three decades. It's amazing the, the, the dedication to it. Jim had the, such a dedication to it. Um, and now it's one of the longest running shows that we have on the air. Um, and he had so many interesting topics. Uh, some of them I was more interested in than others, but I just was very impressed by the amount of work and the amount of detail that Jim would put into each episode. Mm -hmm. So I think it's appropriate, um, with your sense of humor, to tell one of your favorite Jim stories. Okay. Um, my favorite story, really, uh, one day, and this is a testament to Jim's conviction to his show, uh, one day we had a massive snowstorm. Um, and and we, Mike Valentine and myself both had to be here because that was back in the day when we did school closings and we couldn't do them remotely. We had to come in here and log into a computer um, so I was here, and Jim was the only show on the schedule, and he was due to come in at like 9.30 or 10, and we knew he would. We knew that the storm wouldn't stop him, and um, the snow was coming down like feathers. And I, So I said to Mike Valentine, I said, I'm going to hide behind the cabinet when Jim comes in, tell him that I, I went off the road. Um, so Jim comes in, raring to go with the show, and Mike says, I'm sorry, Jim, Tom went off the road and he can't make it in. Jim's first comment, well, who's going to do my show? 
And then I came around, I'm like, well, thanks for being concerned for my welfare, Jim. And mm -hmm. we all got a kick out of that. That was funny yep. that he was good. Just like the, the phrase, uh, um, rain, snow, wind, lightning, nothing was going to stop Jim mm -hmm. from producing that show. Yeah. So he had, he had great zeal and, you know, he loved doing it. And, and you could tell that. And he was also, I've often said, very persuasive. So two of uh, Jim's things that he said to me over the years that just weren't true, call me up. I won't keep you long on the phone. So, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> about 55 minutes later. And then when he was really arm twisting me to keep the show, and he said, oh, you, you can do this. It's only a half hour a month. Right. Yeah, right, yeah. Jim. Yeah. But, um, I'm, I'm delighted to be continuing this legacy, uh, to continue bringing this show. And what I want to say in conclusion to this episode is, Helen, I know that you are going to be watching this, and I do have to say that none of this could have happened without your steadfast support and love for Jim all those years that you were at his side. May he rest in peace.